my mother started hemorrhaging and I was alone in the house with her and she told me what to do. You know, I called an ambulance. I called my father's mother, which my mother had told me to do, said, you know, you have to come get me or, you know, you have someone has to come take care of me. And my mother was taken away in an ambulance and given sort of cultural conditions at that time, I was not allowed to go see her in the hospital. She died about two weeks later, and so I had never seen her again after that night when, when she went away by, the, by ambulance. And then I was suddenly living with my father's parents. My, meanwhile, my father had been totally out of my life since I was four, and I barely knew them. So if you count the divorce as the first major disruption, this was now the second where I was living with these, these near strangers. Hello there at the End of the Tunnel listeners. It's your host, Light Watkins. And this week on the podcast, I'm honored to have as my guest one of the most prominent teachers in the meditation community, Sharon Salzberg. For those of you who don't know, Sharon is one of the original Buddhist meditators who helped to introduce meditation to mainstream America back in the 1970s, along with Joseph Goldstein, Jack Kornfield, John Kabat-Zinn, and of course, Ram Dass. And I've been a huge fan of hers for a very long time. In fact, she and Jack Kornfield and Joseph Goldstein just celebrated their 45th anniversary as co-founders of the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts. And Sharon also just released her 11th book, which is called Real Change back in October, and it's wonderful. Sharon is a New York Times bestselling author. She's a world-renowned meditation teacher. She's host of the Meta Hour podcast, which has over 3 million downloads. And she also recently celebrated her 50th anniversary as a daily meditator. 50 years. That's just incredible. But what's most remarkable to me about Sharon's story is how she started out, which is probably the furthest one could be from a future meditation guru. But according to the Indian teacher Deepama, who requested that Sharon start teaching in the first place, Sharon possessed the most ideal qualification for becoming an effective meditation teacher. And to Sharon's surprise, it wasn't her wealth of spiritual knowledge. It wasn't her proximity to some of the other most dedicated spiritual teachers in the world. It was simply the fact that Sharon understood suffering. You see, before the age of 16, Sharon had experienced five family configurations that had each been altered by death or trauma, including the untimely death of her mother at age nine. And little did Sharon know, her quest for answers would lead her literally to the other side of the world, taking part in strange rituals that would give her her first taste of inner peace and a lifelong camaraderie with a handful of Westerners who would go on to become the central figures of the Western meditation movement, the sort of modern day transcendentalists. And so anyway, I'm excited for you to hear Sharon's backstory in her own words, and I think it's going to inspire you to see your own trajectory, however unpredictable it's been, as perfect for whatever gifts that you are meant to bring into this world. So without further ado, I introduce you to the incomparable Sharon Salzberg. Sharon, thanks so much for coming on to At the End of the Tunnel. I'm honored to have you. I've, I've followed your work for a long time. We crossed paths several years ago at Wanderlust in uh, Hollywood. You were facilitating a workshop there. And so that was a really exciting moment for me. So I have a lot of questions about your life. I want to fill in some of the gaps. As a proponent of meditation, so having an, an, an understanding of how things work in that world, and also just as someone who's out in the world and navigating the world and trying to be relatable and all of those things. So my first question for you, though, is what is your meditation practice like these days, right? In terms of what's your ritual? Do you wake up first thing in the morning, meditate? Do you have tea first? Is it like an all day thing where you just kind of sit whenever you feel the need to? Like what you've been doing this for a very long time now, decades. What, what is it like today? I have been doing it for a very long time. And first of all, thank you so much for having me on. It's it's wonderful to talk to you. I just celebrated a kind of awesome anniversary. I realized I've been practicing for 50 years. 
<laughs> I first did a retreat in India. That's how I learned how to meditate. It began January 7th, 1971. It was like, oh, wow. <laughs> it's outrageous to think about. It's just dreamlike. It's such a dream. So I still practice every day. It's interesting in sort of pandemic times where I'm not traveling at all. And I'm not like going out and seeing people at all, like, you know, so many. I see my practice is really conforming to what is the classical description or delineation. There's like the formal period of practice where you may be sitting, or you may be walking, you may be lying down, whatever posture. But it's just like a period of dedication for these 10 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour. My goal is to deepen awareness and compassion, not to figure out my strategic plan or something like that may come up, but that's not the intention. And then there's what we call short moments many times, which is just like sprinkling some mindfulness into your life. Probably the most famous comes from the Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, who suggested, don't pick up your phone on the first ring. Let it ring three times and breathe. And then you pick it up so that the, the sound of the phone ringing is the signal. Like, okay, come back to yourself. So, so I find in these times I'm doing both a lot more. I do try to sit in the morning. It's usually after caffeine of some kind, <laughs> you know, tea or coffee. But I like having that period. And I, I try to sit for, let's say, half an hour, you know, maybe 40 minutes, but it could be 20 minutes also. And because of the current conditions of my life, you know, I have so much more space and time to sort of do the other, you know? And I mean, one thing I've noticed about myself in this time is that I've actually I guess, made a resolve to be kinder, you know, not even consciously, but I see that I'm I'm rereading emails before pressing send. I'm just taking that time. <laughs> and then I think, well, could this be misinterpreted? This is like a harsh form of communication, you know, to begin with. And maybe I better take that sentence out, you know. So I find I'm I'm kind of practicing all through the day in different ways. When you think back to little Sharon, right, your earliest memories, what was your favorite toy or activity? When I was a little bit older, not a tiny little tot, but it was always reading. You know, it was always, always reading, you know, because that was my experience of the world other than within the household. So definitely a lot of that. I remember also raising little caterpillars in a box, but they didn't sadly last long. <laughs> you know? I want to talk about that because you mentioned that in an interview before. You said your favorite animal was the caterpillar, but not the butterfly. <laughs> what was this fascination with caterpillars? You know, I don't remember exactly how it started, if it was like some relative or cousin or something like that. But but I remember the box. I remember sort of the dirt, you know, and, and the in effect, the prayers that this little being would, would survive, which did not. but. And you can get the symbolism of it. Well, it was all about change, you know. It was all about there's another world. Were you an only child? From the time I was nine, I was growing up with my grandparents, with my father's parents. So, And before then, you know, there had already been, like, tremendous disruption and, and loss in my household. So it was always – I was the only child, and it was always the kind of family – dynamic where these things were never really ever openly talked about. And so I also had a strong internal world that I kept checking in with, but it wasn't getting any kind of confirmation from the external world. Like, yeah, the way you see things is true. That's really what happened. You know, it was none of that. So, so there was kind of a big split there. You had a tragedy with your mom. She, she was a big Nat King Cole fan. You, you've mentioned before. Did she have a favorite Nat King Cole song? That I don't remember, but she died when I was nine. And my parents had gotten divorced when I was four. My father disappeared so for that time. And so I was living with my mother and her sister and brother in that time in the Bronx before 
when she died, I moved to Washington Heights. You know, so my my memories are very kind of like an image, you know, without a lot of context. It's like, oh, right, you know, I remember that. Can you talk a little bit about that night you guys were watching Nat King Cole and how that affected you? My mother started hemorrhaging, and I was alone in the house with her, and she told me what to do. You know, I called an ambulance. I called my father's mother, which my mother had told me to do said, you know, you have to come get me or, you know, you have someone has to come take care of me. And my mother was taken away in an ambulance and given sort of cultural conditions at that time, I was not allowed to go see her in the hospital. She died about two weeks later. And so I had never seen her again after that night when she went away by the by ambulance. And so then I was suddenly living with my my father's parents. My meanwhile my father had been totally out of my life since I was four and I barely knew them. So that was, um, if you count the divorce as the first major disruption, this was now the second. Did you have a spiritual or some sort of religious foundation where you could process these disruptions? My grandparents were immigrants from Poland and I think they had a a certain cultural value that they believed the kindest thing was just not to bring up my mother's name again, which they didn't, you know, that it would upset me too much. It would hurt me too much. And they were fairly observant Jews. And, and so I fell into the ritual of that. I wouldn't say I understood it or, you know, why we couldn't turn on the lights on Saturday or something like that. But what I did have was a voice within at some point, you know, probably a little later than nine, which was very clear to me that there was another way of being or there was another kind of life waiting for me or there was something else, you know, beyond these circumstances. And and uh, I also intuited that studying and being really good at school was going to be a vehicle for that. And so in a way, I was kind of biding my time. Interesting. So with the Dalai Lama, there he's recognized as a child and kind of groomed to become this spiritual leader. I'm curious, and this is just a hypothetical question. Let's say three wise men came to you, <laughs> you know, back then when you were when you were a teenager after having dealt with all of that, and said, "Sharon, one day you will be one of a handful of people to introduce this." really powerful Eastern practice to mainstream America and and your work will affect millions of people and help them to find inner peace and happiness within. What would 14 or 15 year old Sharon have thought about that, that prediction? I would have thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> and, <laughs> and not only that, when uh, it sounds like you've read my book, Faith, to know these details of my life, you know, so. When my own teacher, this woman named Deepama, told me to teach, which was 1974, you know, I'd been in India at that point for a number of years. I was coming back to the States for what I thought was a very brief visit back before I went back to India for the entire rest of my life. And I went to Calcutta to see her just to say goodbye and get her blessing for my very, very brief journey back to the States. And she said, when you go back, you'll be teaching. And I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. I said, no, I won't. I mean, I thought it was ludicrous that I could do a thing like that. And and she kept saying, yes, you will. And I kept saying, no, I won't. I'm coming right back. And, And then she said two things that were really remarkable, which really set the path for the rest of my life. One was, you really understand suffering. That's what you should teach which looking back was an extraordinary thing to say. First of all, she herself as a human being, as a woman, had suffered tremendously in life, the loss of two of her children, loss of her husband, whom she loved very much. And and it was through that pain, actually, that she sought meditation and found some way of kind of almost metabolizing the suffering into compassion. 
And she was an extraordinary person, an extraordinary teacher. So hearing that from her meant something, you know. And I thought at one point, I thought, oh, it's funny. She didn't say, like, your realization is so awesome where you're, you know, your scholarship is so erudite, you know. It's like you really understand suffering. That's why you should teach, which is an interesting reflection on the the challenges of our lives, you know, and, and the strengths it may also give us. And then she said to me, Way back in 1974, she said, you can do anything you want to do. It's your thinking you can't do it. That's what's going to stop you. And I left her room, which was like on the fourth floor of this building, and I went down these stairs thinking the whole time, no, I won't. I'm not going to do that. You know. So, And I will say also, when I, I did start teaching, because of course she was right and I was wrong, with Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield and other friends, I don't think one of us had the kind of vision that you just described as, <laughs> you know, none of us thought, let's start a movement. Let's really, you know, it was like these methods, these techniques have helped each of us so much personally. And we have the blessing, we have the authorization, you could say, to pass it on from our own teachers and the, the great encouragement of our own teachers to pass it on. Let's see if anyone here is interested. Let's try this one retreat. Let's do this. Let's do that. And it was always one step at a time. We made plenty of mistakes. But nowadays, people often say, wow, you must have had such vision. And I think, well, not really. That's one of the uh, my objectives with telling these stories is showing people when you look at the details of someone's trajectory, there were some embers in childhood, perhaps, right? But obviously, you're too young to be able to understand it, what what that is. And then these little course correction things happen, and as you described them, they're family configurations that have been altered by death. And you had five of those, which then, you know, catapulted you. You find yourself in college at 16 years old, college in Buffalo. And that's where you kind of happened to take this Asian philosophy class. Why, why did you take that class at that time? Well, there were certain requirements. You know, you needed a philosophy course, you needed a language course, you needed these different things over the course of, of the four years. And, and uh, when I was a sophomore, I decided to fulfill the philosophy requirement. And I just looked at the schedule and I thought, oh, there's an Asian philosophy course. That's on Tuesday. That's convenient. Let me do that one. So, of course, it totally changed my life. How were you thinking about success at that time? I don't know if I thought that way, honestly, at the age of 16. I was in some way, you know, the immediacy of life, like what am I going to major in, you know, was very important. I was also reconciling my past in a way that I had never done before. So like of those five family configurations, by the time I was 16, going to college, some ended like, you know, one change with my parents' divorce, one change with my mother's death. And, and then I lived with my grandparents and then my grandfather died and my father came back. So I was 11 years old. He had, I hadn't seen him since I was four. He was really, he was sort of a wreck at that point, you know, from alcohol and mental illness and, and very different from the, I think the reality of how he'd been before I was four and the image I held of him all this time. And he was only there for about six weeks in my grandma's house when he took an overdose of sleeping pills and he was taken away by ambulance as well to a mental health facility. And he stayed in some kind of facility, VA hospital or nursing home or halfway house or something for the rest of his life, which was some decades. So my grandmother and, and other relatives said, well, he had an accident. You know, he took, he took a sleeping pill. He didn't remember he'd taken a sleeping pill. So he took another one, and it was too much. So he had to go to the hospital. And it was only, you know, so that was when I was 11. It was only when I was in college that I started thinking, that's a funny 
trigger to have you end up in a psychiatric hospital for, you know, now another eight years or nine years or something like that. And I thought, huh. You know, so I was kind of putting the pieces together of my life and trying to figure out who I was. And I mean, the miracle of that time is that I heard about meditation in that Asian philosophy class. And I didn't think, that sounds interesting. Maybe when I'm like all grown up, I'll try it or, you know, maybe, or I could never do it. You know, that's for other people, which would be more likely. And, or, you know, that'd be interesting thing to maybe pursue in graduate school. Or, you know, it was so other than that, it was so like, I've got to learn how to do this. I think this could really help me. And I was going to school in Buffalo. I looked around Buffalo. This is 1970. I just didn't see it anywhere. It was not to be found, or at least by me. And so I created an independent study project. The American Studies Department had an independent study program, so that settled on what my major was going to be. And I presented the project, and I said, I'd like to go to India and study meditation. And they said, okay. Did you have to like sell cookies or raise money to go to India or get somebody's permission? Or what was the backstory of that? It was my junior year of college. So I went with my student loans and scholarships. So that, you know, that was not a problem. And, and also in those days, I think I'm, none of us flew. We all flew to Europe and went overland some one way or another, you know, like train and bus. And I know your parents were not in the scene. Maybe you're, you're still in touch with your grandparents. Would you have talked to someone about that? And they maybe they push back, oh, I don't know, India is a really strange, and you had to kind of overcome that, or, or were you just kind of out there on your own, just like, I'm doing whatever I want to do, and, and it doesn't matter what anybody thinks about it? You know, I more told them, I mean, they were very worried, of course, this was, you know. <laughs> right. This is also a long time ago. There, yeah, well, there were no cell phones, there was no internet, there were not any faxes. It's like, if you wanted to make an international call from India, first you had to go to a big city which had the facility for that, usually check into some international hotel, book a trunk call for 24 hours hence, you know, go to some place in a booth and scream, you know. It was a very big deal. It was a very big deal. And even, you know, like people often say, because it's unbelievable, you know, to generations, you know, younger than mine, that we had no internet, you know. So it would be like, how did you find out where the port of the great new teacher was or where where that retreat was going to be? Like, well, people told you, you know, like everything was dependent on that kind of communication. Or eavesdropping in restaurants. Exactly. That happened too, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> okay. So before your trip, you meet this sort of Obi-Wan Kenobi figure, Trungpa Rinpoche in Buffalo. Talk about that experience. I was going to the university. There were also other colleges in Buffalo, and Trungpa Rinpoche was a Tibetan teacher, Tibetan Lama, and somehow on his first trip to North America, he got sent to Buffalo <laughs> to speak at one of these other colleges. So this is about four days before I was getting ready to leave for India, and this is a small group of friends and I were going together. Some people doing things on education and, you know, like people from Buffalo. And I was 18 at this point. I was very naive. I'd never even been to California before, and I was about to go to India. And I had an idea that practices held within the Buddhist tradition, this is all from that Asian philosophy class that I took, would be like very kind of simple and direct. And you also, as, as you know, they often talk about, you don't need to like become a Buddhist or join anything or reject anything else. It's really about methods. So that's what I was really aiming toward, but I had no idea where to go. Like, I don't know anything about India, you know, where to find a teacher or anything. And so there was Trungpa Rinpoche, like a living embodiment of, a Buddhist meditation teacher. So they asked for written questions at his talk. And 
I wrote out the question, like my friends and I are about to leave for India in like three or four days to study Buddhist meditation. Do you have any idea where we should go? And he had this big pile of questions in front of him and he pulled out my question and read it out loud. Do you have any idea where we should go? Any recommendations? And he was silent for a moment and then he said, I think you had perhaps best follow the pretense of accident. And that was it. Like no addresses, no handy <laughs> monastery guidebook. I think you had perhaps best follow the pretense of accident. That's exactly the way it worked out. I went to India. We started in Dharamsala because I'd heard the Dalai Lama lived there. I'd heard he was a Buddhist. And there were meditation classes and there were wonderful teachers. And it was the kind of situation where you know, it's like when something just doesn't work. It's like, it just didn't work. I'd go to the meditation class and be told, oh, the translator's like gone for a few weeks, you know, so I'd go back in two weeks. I say, oh, the teacher had to go to the dentist who's in Calcutta, the other end of India, you know, and come back in three weeks. So, then, you know, it just wasn't working. And I did overhear a conversation at a restaurant saying that there was going to be an international Hatha yoga conference in New Delhi. And I thought, oh, that's it. I'll go there. And that's where I'll find a teacher. And I went there, and it was like a completely, nearly completely dismal experience where the low point was when these yogis and swamis were pushing and shoving against each other to be the first to grab the microphone and speak. And I thought, oh, great, you know, this is hopeless. But also at that conference, a young man named Dan Goldman, who we tend to know these days as the author of Emotional Intelligence, you know, all these years later. But Dan was giving a talk at that conference. He was at the time a graduate student in psychology. He was studying meditation. And somehow he ended up giving a talk at this conference. And he mentioned at the end of the talk that he was on his way to this town called Bodhgaya in India, where uh, there was going to be an intensive 10-day like immersion course into meditation. And it was very practical. You don't have to join anything. You don't have to you know, reject anything else, exactly what I've been looking for. And I thought, oh, that's it. That's what, that's what I need. And it was it. You know, I and actually many others followed after Dan to, to Bhagaya and joined in this course, and that began January 7th, 1971. What was your feeling of India being completely opposite of Buffalo, New York? I mean, because, you know, like you said, this is before a lot of conveniences, and you're traveling around in cars, you know, 17 hours, you're on trains. It's like you got deli belly stuff happening. I mean, you got to watch out what you're eating. And it's like all these people and animals and just all this stuff is all this commotion is happening. Did you feel like you were home when you were in India or were you kind of tolerating it to get the knowledge that you came for? I felt like I was home. I was also terrified. I mean, you know, I was also, that was true too. But I felt like I was home just to, I mean, it took a while to get there because, like I said, you know, we took a plane to the Orient Express train, which was like days and days to get to Turkey and then ferries and boats and buses and trains and all the way through the, the Mideast to get to Pakistan and then, and then India. And, and somehow, as soon as I got to India, I, I just felt at home. There was something also about the openness of it after all the kind of concealment of my earlier life, it's like, there's street life. Like if you take, uh, I remember bringing in some of our Indian teachers from India to visit here in the States, and it would get to be in certain, a lot of places, you know, eight o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night, and the teacher would say, where's everybody? You know, like, <laughs> the streets are empty. That's so unnatural. And, you know, there was so much openness. And yeah, I felt I felt quite at home there. So you're at this 10-day retreat. This is in Bogaya, And you meet Ram Dass as well for the first time. What was your impression of him? Well, the teacher of the retreat was S.N. Goenka, and he had just left Burma pretty 
recently before then to visit his mother who'd been ill in Bombay and she got better and he began teaching. And so he was very new to teaching outside of Burma because Dan Goldman had inspired quite a number of people from that conference to go. This was, this was a group of people, you know, it was a real gathering. And at that retreat, Ramdas was a student there. He was attending as a student. He, of course, had been to India himself before. He was Ramdas, not Richard Alpert. At that point, he'd come back to India after, I think, a couple of years in America. And there was a group of people sort of with him. They'd heard him on the radio. They encountered him somehow in the States. And they were kind of with him really trying to meet his teacher, his guru, but I mean, both old style. He was an old style guru. You didn't exactly know where he was going to be next and he'd appear and disappear and be somewhere else, you know, like, so they didn't know where he was, where the teacher was. And there was no, you know, you couldn't text everybody or email <laughs> everybody and say, Hey, you spotted, you know? So they were trying to do worthy things with their time, you know, so there's a whole group of them who were attending this course with Ramdas. So it was Ramdas, Krishnadas, lots of people who are still good friends. You know, I look back, Ramdas, he was like the patriarch. He'd already been fired from Harvard. He'd already had a guru and a new name. And looking back, I realized, oh, he was like 38 or 39 years old. He seemed so mm. old, you know. <laughs> he was really, he was really the patriarch. And it was when we were there together practicing that the first box, the first appearance of Be Here Now, his his great book, was not a book, it was a box. You know, and everything was like loose, the, re the chai recipes and the, you know, things like that. So I remember him getting the box and we all opened the box and we were looking and ooing and aahing and looking at all this stuff and everything felt you know, very fresh. It was really very new and exciting. It was such a sense of community and such a sense of discovery. It's like, oh, look what my breath feels like when I do this. Or, you know, every little thing was so meaningful. So you were still relatively young at that time. You're like 19, 20 years old. If if I were to speak with Dan or somebody who was around at that time, Krishna Das, and say, what were your reflections of Sharon at the time? What What would they have said? She's very quiet. She's very sweet. <laughs> Krishna Das and I teach together a fair amount, and we often tell the same story, each from our own perspective, because uh, Goenka taught many retreats in a row. And there'd be little gaps in between, and and then there'd be another retreat. And one of the gaps, Dan had gone to Allahabad, which is where... It's the grounds of this huge gathering, the Kumbh Mela, you know, which has this astrological points of like every four years is this and every 12 years is this. And when it's the big one, you know, it's millions and millions and millions of people who come together to bathe in Ganges. And the largest gathering of humans on earth, they say. So Dan had gone there and then he came back to Bodh Gaya and we were practicing. And then the, the Mela was over, but. This group of people around Ramdas, some people who had really were at those courses because of Ramdas, some people who met Ramdas there, decided that they were going to get in this bus. Oh my God, you were there? I was there, sure. Well, On the bus? No, no, no. I waved goodbye oh, to the bus. Okay. <laughs> That's why Christian Das and I tell the story, same story from two different angles. Like, they decided they were going to get in this bus and tour around looking for Maharaji. And they had no idea where he was. And there was no, again, you know, it wasn't like a blog someone was going to write, spotted in, you know, <laughs> Benares, this guru, new Curly Baba. So I remember deliberating internally, do I want to get on that bus? I thought, no, I've just discovered this practice. It's really important for me. They don't even know where the guy is, you know, like, I'm just going to keep meditating here. So when they left, 
Ramdas was the only one with a name like Ramdas. They were like Linda and Jeffrey and somewhere as they tell the story, because now I'm I'm not privy to it. They're on the bus and Danny Dan Goldman wants to have the bus detour and see the grounds where the Kumbamela had been. It wasn't even there anymore, but and Ramdas said no. He he wanted to go right on to Delhi and they had this discussion and Finally, Ramna said, okay, let's just, we'll go look at the the grounds of the Mela. And they got there, and there was Maharaji waiting for them by the side of the road. And uh, apparently he had woken up that morning and told his hosts, make lunch for, I don't know, let's say 28 people. And there were exactly 28 people, including the bus driver. You know, so at one point I said to Krishnadas, well, how long did it take you to find him? And he said, 10 hours. You know, so it was life choices. It was very interesting right there. So you had your first experience. I think it was the last day of the 10-day retreat where Essen Gwanka talked about Meta. Talk about that, how that made you feel. Yeah, well, the main engine for that retreat and for many, many approaches to meditation is mindfulness, which is really a way of trying to get closer to your experience, having your your awareness be less cluttered, less filled with like old fears or future projections, so you can see much more accurately what your experience really is. It's like maybe it's pain, but it's not pain plus, you know, the anticipation of the next 50 years not feeling any better. That was really the the essential tool in that 10-day retreat. But right at the end, almost as a ceremonial way of saying goodbye, Goenka introduced this other method, which is called metta, M-E-T-T-A, two Ts. And uh, metta means loving kindness. It was one particular form, one way of doing it. There are many, many ways of doing it, but it was my first introduction. And so there, rather than trying to just get closer to the truth of your experience, whatever it is, you're actually actively offering kind of goodwill and well wishes to yourself and to others. So going to did it a certain way through sensation in the body, because that was very much his approach with mindfulness as, as being aware. But it's almost like fill your body with the sense of warmth and caring, and then you offer it ultimately to all of life, including yourself. So I was just riveted. I thought, wow, what's this? You know, like, I really want to learn this method, but I never, I mean, I studied it, you know, and I I tried to understand it. And of course, I was sitting with Goenka at times, and he was doing it in that same way right at the end of, of his mindfulness retreat. And it was only in 1985 that I went to Burma and did a three-month intensive meditation retreat on loving kindness on that particular technique. And, you know, they they taught it somewhat differently than going ahead done, but it's the same essence. And it became hugely important for me in my practice. And that was my intuition beforehand anyway. It's why, you know, I really wanted to learn it. And so that was 85. I came back, I started teaching it right away as a method. My first book was called Loving Kindness, and that came out about 10 years later because I'm very slow. After Deepama had ordained you a future teacher and you kind of push back on that, you still are kind of wandering around, linking up with Joseph in Colorado and staying in these houses with people and stuff like that. Can you just walk us through how you went from there to how you guys ended up starting the center in, in Barrie? Well, I, I, you know, went and saw Deepa in uh, Calcutta in 1974, came back to the States. I was on the East Coast. I was with my family. I did sort of the preparatory work for like getting a new visa to go back to India forever and all that. Did they think you were weird when you were back with your family? 
Yeah, I mean, everyone was so glad to see me, and they're so relieved, you know. And but you know, I also didn't have the either the sophistication or the language to really explain. Like if they said to me, as they did, "Are you still Jewish?" I would say, "Yeah, of course." You know, like I didn't know how to describe what I'd been doing. You know, but a group of us thought, "Oh well, this is another whole Ramdas story." But Joseph Goldstein, who was also at my first retreat, that's where we met, had come back to the states about six months before I did, and he was traveling across the country with some friends, and he stopped in Boulder, Colorado. So Boulder was the site where Trunk Perimbache, same Trunk Perimbache you know, that had sent me off with the pretense of accident, no addresses, was establishing this institute called Naropa, Naropa Institute. Now it's a university because it's gotten affiliated. But in those days it was an institute and it was the first place I'd heard of where there was like meditation and textual study of Hinduism and Buddhism and Tai Chi, martial arts, and so many things being offered. So this is prior to the official opening, which was in the summer. And Joseph stopped there and asked in their office, uh, he said, you know, I've been living in India for seven years. My teachers have told me to teach. I've started teaching in India. Would you like me to teach a course? And they said, no, thanks. You know, so, <laughs> so he went on to Berkeley. And as he tells the story, Chris, we'd known Ram Dass from India and, you know, we're good friends. And so he said he got to Berkeley and he called Ram Dass and the answering machine, which is what it was in those days, had a very forbidding message, like not talking to anybody, don't leave a message. You know? <laughs> so Joseph went off to Telegraph Avenue to continue on the pretense of accident theme. He needed to use a bathroom. So he went into some cafe and they said, only for customers. And in a way, I still can't figure out, like, he didn't buy, like, a bagel or something, you know? He decided to go to another place to look for a bathroom. And I think he was, he was on his third place when he walked in, and there was Ramdas sitting <laughs> in the cafe. <laughs> so Ramdas was about to go to Boulder to Naropa Institute, where he had, like, a mega class of, like, a 1,000 people. And he asked Joseph if he would come lead the meditation subgroup. So we say he gave Joseph his first teaching job in the States, which is true. So Joseph went to Boulder and was very, very popular teaching that. So he was actually invited to stay on for the second summer session. But this is still the first summer session. And some friends and I decided, you know what, let's go to Boulder and visit Joseph. So we went to Boulder, and Joseph was living in a one-bedroom apartment, like a student apartment that Naropa had given him. And at one point, nine of us moved in to his one-bedroom apartment. And it was really onerous. Jack Cornfield was living down the hall. That's where we met. And I stayed on with Joseph for the second summer session. I was kind of his TA. And then we got invited to teach a month-long retreat, Joseph and I. So we did. And then we got a letter from somebody saying, you know, I can get together some friends and a cook. Would you come teach a retreat? So it was Jack, Joseph, and I and a couple of other friends. And it would be different configurations of some of us. And we had nothing. You know, we had no home. We had nothing. I mean, they had both still living parents, you know, but on the East Coast. And, but we were just like sleeping in people's living room couches, literally crashing at people's homes. And one day, one of the people who I think had <laughs> hosted us the most said in some self-defense, like, I have a rental property down near Santa Cruz. Why don't you move in there? So we did. And we opened it as a retreat center where it was just a house, but you could come and do your own retreat and we would cook for you and just have a supportive environment. And somebody came through at one point uh, writing a book and wanting that kind of atmosphere. 
And he said, you know, you should really start a real retreat center. You should start a center of your own where it would be like a kind of sacred site in this country. It would be a place where the kind of energy that's generated when people come together doesn't have to disperse. And he said, I know that people can help you. They're all in Massachusetts. And he was right. They were the people. You know, formed uh, a nonprofit, formed a board. We were able to kind of understand what we were looking for, found it, did the negotiation. We ended up buying this property in Barry, Massachusetts for $150,000, which we did not have. This is an institutional building or set of buildings that sleep about 100 and everything, you know, kitchen and whatever. It was $150,000. So it was owned by the Catholic Church, by the Fathers of the Blessed Sacrament. So they gave us a $50,000 mortgage. We raised $50,000. We couldn't get a bank to give us a mortgage for the other 50000 So these friends went off to the bank and they personally took out loans so that we could open open the doors. And uh, so that's the Insight Meditation Society in Barry, Massachusetts. A couple of questions about this. When you get a room of meditators together, usually they're not very business savvy people, especially people who've been spent a lot of time in India and you're following your heart and doing all these kind of kind of what people would consider airy fairy things, you know, especially if you work in the banking industry. Who was the driving force? Who was the organizer? Who was the task rabbit in that circle that made sure that things the, the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed and things like that? I mean, we were really lucky that group of people that formed the first board, you know, the first board of directors. And they quickly saw we were not that capable and <laughs> You know, so many realms. And we had a policy for a long time, which we used to call the separation of church and state, you know, where the teachers would decide, like, who else to invite to teach and what would be taught there. And the board would decide everything a board is responsible for, you know, finances and and so on. And so ultimately they had a lot of power. And clearly we knew nothing, you know, like we also grew up in a tradition in Asia, grew up in, in that sense, you know, where you did not really charge for the teachings. In some of the places we paid room and boards, other places we paid nothing because even that was provided. And voluntary donations to the teachers happened, you know, or to the monastery and and suddenly we're in the land of, well, the staff really needs health insurance. You can't, you know, fairly have a staff here and not, not give them health. And it's like, huh, do I need health insurance too? <laughs> I guess I do. It's a different world. And, you know, so when we open the doors, we charge $6.50 a night. And we had no money. You know, like somebody's father gave them a car. That's why we had a car. Or, you know, it was like those days. I remember a very early board meeting. One of the board members said, well, you're not thinking about depreciation. So I or somebody said, what's depreciation? <laughs> and they said, well, you know, like, what if a roof le starts leaking? Or And we said, oh, well, you know, we'll just raise money for it. Like, not realizing we weren't in Asia anymore, you know. So it was a real education, and I think necessary, but it was all dependent on those people. You know, we could never have done it without them. You guys just celebrated 45 years. We did. What do you think is the secret to having a center like that stick around for such a long time? Having an empowered board is part of that. We don't have the same separation of church and state anymore. But I think that's very important because it's also, in a way, it's like the voice of the people, you know, so there's like a an exchange. We've always, uh, as you got from that call, you know, somebody quoted me as saying we didn't know what we were doing, which was true. Jack quoted me as saying we did it all without adult supervision, which is also true. 
we always were trying to find a balance between having a sense of tradition and recognition that we didn't just make this up and and at the same time looking at where we are you know and and what are the kinds of things people are facing if you look at classical buddhist teaching about livelihood for example interestingly enough he does talk about livelihood you know the way we work or the way we actually for many of us spend most of our day most of our life therefore is in work and how that can be very damaging because we feel uh tremendous moral dilemmas or you know all kinds of things or or it can be unifying and bring all of our lives together but you look at classical teaching and it'll say no hunting no fishing like no killing no dealing in arms but even there, you know, the Buddha sort of seemed to have flexibility. If a monk was going off to teach in a fishing village, he'd say, they have to fish. You know, that's that's like their livelihood. So then they would talk about what to say. But, you know, what does any of that mean now? You know, somebody tells me, as they have, you know, I work for this company and our policy, not my policy, the, the company's policy, when somebody makes a request is to immediately turn them down because it's only the people who are kind of loud, you know, the squeaky wheels, they get listened to. So the first thing you have to do is say no. And they were weeping when they were saying that, you know, like, what does that mean in terms of the morality of our work right now in, in the things we face? And so as a community, we've always been in that tension, you know, how to look back and honor and, and be aligned with, you know, what seems really good and essential and how to adapt and be open and be flexible and be free. And so from the get go, it's been like that. You also have personally experienced a few waves of this sort of popularization of meditation. And, you know, you were there when the TM stuff started. You were, you were one of the proponents of Buddhist insight meditation. Now we're in this kind of other, this, I don't know if it's a third or fourth wave of it. What can history about meditation waves teach us about where this is all going? I think for any person, any human being like myself, it's also kind of sensing where you fit in all of that. I have colleagues who are, mainly devoted or largely devoted, even though they're doing other things, they're devoted to helping train the next generation of teachers. And, you know, these days, because of the popularization, there, there are many different kinds of training programs and people take them and often do incredibly wonderful things with that credential, if it's a credential. But I've also heard in the effort to really make meditation available to everybody, pressure to have a training program that may not be that thorough. Like I was once talking to somebody, a friend, and she felt she had an entree into a particular organization or institution, and they were really going to have meditation be much more widespread within their organization, but they didn't want to keep bringing in outside people to teach. They wanted their own in-house people to be trained. So she said, so now I'm thinking that I have to help create a train the trainers model. So I said, well, how long's the training? And she said, eight hours. And I said, <laughs> you cannot do that. You just cannot do that. But that happens a lot, too, alongside the really good training programs. And so IMS, the Insight Meditation Society, has its own training program, which is really a little specialized to that. You know, we are an intensive retreat center. We're, we're not in the city. We're way out of the country. People, come, when they were coming, <laughs> you know, come for overnight stays or for retreats. And so it's a certain kind of training. It's like a four-year training. and some people are just doing that. That's what they're devoted to. Some people really want to teach beginners. It's a whole other thing. You know, it's like 
then you have to think about apps and technology and maybe being in a city, you know, as we gather together again, you know, physically and, or learning how to teach online, you know, it's a whole other thing. You know, so I think people need to find their place of what feels inspiring and right. Do you personally do things today that you would not have even considered doing before in order to stay relevant as one of the most influential teachers in the meditation space? Well, I'm always doing things I never considered doing, like giving talks publicly or things like that. But I don't consciously have that thought. Like, I need to, I mean, people have told me that, you know, like, oh, you need to. Like, I need to, I need to get my Instagram. I need to, like, you know, make sure my oh, yeah, social no, I have media a, I have tweet all that. more. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't need to tweet more. I tweet, I, mean, I live on Twitter. <laughs> Believe me, I live on Twitter. Yeah, I get all my news on Twitter now. I'm, I'm very Twitter oriented. You're also a very prolific writer. You know, a lot of people, they'll write a book and writing a book can feel like an iron, like doing an Ironman competition. And I feel like a lot of people, they do it once and or twice and then they're done. But you're like, what, a dozen books in at this point. Are you more of a writer now that teaches meditation or, <laughs> or are you a meditation teacher that makes the time to keep, keep organizing your thoughts in that way? I think I'm more a writer now in a way, you know, because I had always wanted to be a writer and circumstances are just such I am not traveling at all. You know, I used to travel really a lot. And I was saying to somebody the other day, it's not only the travel time, but it was all the arranging time. Like who's going to pick me up at the airport? Where should I stay? And what should I do? And is that hotel? That, you know, that was a lot of time. <laughs> and it's all recaptured now. And I am trying to teach online as much as I can and lots of different forms and I personally find it very fulfilling. I know a lot of people feel uneasy with it. They want more direct contact. They, they don't want to teach online unless they can see everyone's face, for example, on the screen or something like that. But I feel very connected to people anyway. And just reading those chats, you know, there's like if we're on Zoom, there's so many people they're just having such a hard time and are kind of exhausted and and it's usually very touching, like if I teach a retreat or Joseph and I teach a retreat. When it's a retreat, people are often writing in and saying, well, you know, I could never come back right now to the center anyway. You know, like I'm taking care of my mother who's aged or I'm aged, you know. I think those days are gone for me or it's too hard, but this I can do. You know, thank you so much. And people always signing in from all over the world. And it's very, very gratifying. I mean, that program you did celebrating our 45th anniversary, there were people from like 47 countries signed into that. And so I, I really like the medium. I certainly hope to continue, but it's also freed up a lot of time so I can write. Your most recent book, Real Change, is a part of it. Seems like a is it a trilogy, or you're, you you you've kind of adopted this real theme? I know for your last. Few <laughs> it's totally unintentional. Like, real happiness was the first, and the real happiness, real happiness at work, real love, real change. Real change was a joke title. Like <laughs> that publisher said, "What should we call it? Real change?" Ha ha ha. And so we were just banding about real change. Like it was a joke. And then, of course, we couldn't think of another title. So, You mentioned a few principles in, in that book, and I wanted to just talk about them a bit here because I think it's really important for people to be exposed to some of these sort of perception shifts. You, you have, you're really good with perception shifting and, and giving examples of that. One of them, I don't think it was in real change. It was in faith, but – you talked about Trungpa Rinpoche on this whiteboard. He drew this this kind of V-shaped figure, and he, and he asked you all, what do you see? And everybody said, we see a bird. But what was he referring to? He said, it's a picture of the sky with a bird flying through it. So powerful. Just about expanding your awareness of, of what you see. And then you said in Real Change... You said we shouldn't look at childhood trauma as a gift. And you hear that a lot in the spiritual community. You know, trauma, you, this is your gift, your shadow side, just embrace it as a gift. 
you say that we should see it as a given. That was a quotation, actually, from my friend, Roshi John Halifax. And I liked it so much. I actually used it in my prior book as well, Real Love. And when I turned in Real Love, it was sort of a triumph because I was quite late turning in that book. And then I didn't hear anything from my publisher. I got like an away message on vacation. And I thought, great, you know, I could have had another two weeks, something if I'd known. But when I finally heard from him, his comment was, I really liked the book. My favorite part of the book was when you quote Roshi Joan Halifax saying, basically, don't force yourself to try to see the traumas of your past as a gift. They're givens. And I thought first, oh, his favorite part of my book, I didn't even write. <laughs> Joan Halifax wrote it. And then I thought, I agree, actually. I think that that is very, very true and, and therefore worth repeating when I did the next book. And because so many times we sort of try to force ourselves into a certain attitude, like, and in effect say, the fact that this hurts is my fault. You know, if I had a better attitude, if I had less resistance, if I could have a different perspective, it wouldn't hurt. And I don't think that's true. I think this is another part of real change. Some things just hurt, and it's not our fault. And what we really have both possibility and responsibility with is more what I would call the extra suffering. You know, something is very painful, but we add a sense of isolation to that, like I'm the only one or a sense of permanence. This is the only thing I'll ever feel. Or, you know, so many things we might add on just through conditioning or force of habit, and we can let go of those and be with what is painful in a whole new way. Yeah, there's so many gems. There's the, the riddle about the son whose father died in an accident. I don't even want to give that one away. I think people should just read the book <laughs> for that one. Yeah, thank you. You talked about Thai sex trafficking, how that's really a result of conditions of the Thai farmers and how violence is a public health problem. What did you mean by that? Well, there are lots of ways of looking at violence. And, you know, there's a certain school of thought that says, let's look at it as a public health problem. It's a, It's like a crisis, you know, not a sin, so to speak. There's something I also learned more about when I was writing Real Change, which is like attribution bias, where if somebody does something wrong, say commits a violent act, and we relate to them, it's like they look like us, it's one of the same tribe, we don't have a sense of othering them in some way, then we tend to look at causes and conditions, like guns are too readily available in that area or education is so insufficient or, you know, there's so much trauma and kids aren't getting the kind of counseling that they need or whatever. But if somebody is of the other tribe, so to speak, or we consider an other, then we tend to think of that act as reflective of a kind of inherent innate defect like, that's a bad kid, you know, or people like that. You know, we don't look at causes and conditions and circumstances and the environment. That perspective about violence as a public health problem is encouraging is just the former. Like, let's look at causes and conditions. You know, what is promoting this? It's, it's not like some kid is innately bad, you know, or uh, some person is not got a capacity. Maybe that capacity has never been nurtured, you know, never been listened to or honored. And some people, you know, would equate that with laziness or being too lax, but it doesn't have to be. It can be really rigorous, you know, but it's also honest and it's realistic. Like, yeah, you know, let's look at what's happened here. You've also been really good about, I mean, you've been woke for a while, it sounds like, because you personally, you firsthand experienced, you know, incidents of racial discrimination against other people around you and things like that. And so you've kind of, you've been very open about including that in your talks and in your books and in your writing. And that's, I just want to acknowledge you for that. And just to wind this conversation down, I'm, I'm curious, where's the strangest place you've ever heard a Nat King Cole song? 
Good Lord, I don't know, probably an elevator, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Do you see that as your mother sending you a message whenever you hear Nat King Cole now? You know, I kind of do in a way, you know? I mean, there are a few. I don't know how popular he is anymore. He should be. His voice is beautiful. What would she think about you and everything you've been doing in your life right now? You know, I don't know. Sometimes something will happen, like I'm in the New York Times or something like that. And people say to me, your mother would have been very proud of you, which is a very beautiful thing to say. And also sort of noting the absence of that. But when I was writing Faith, which is really like my faith story, so it's very autobiographical, there was a turning in there which was very important for me as a human being. And it just happened because I was in the writing process, which was I was writing about her death when I was nine years old. And there was just this moment when I realized she was like a 36-year-old woman, you know? She was so young, and she was leaving me, her only child. and, And I realized, oh, this is her story. It's actually not my story somehow realizing kind of the integrity of her being and what it must have been like for her was an enormous transformation. It was very important. So obviously it was my story as well, but it was hers also. You've said we don't meditate to get good at meditation. We meditate to get good at life. How does one know when they're getting good at life? Well, that too can be a little confusing because sometimes – Other people see it in us before we see it in ourselves. You know, some people tell me I was going to stop meditating because I thought nothing was happening. And then my kids came to me and said, please don't stop. You're much better. There are things like that. But we do see it in ourselves. Like, listen to how you speak to yourself when you've made a mistake. And are you kinder? Can you begin again a little more gracefully, you know, instead of spending... 18 days chastising yourself for having blown it in some way. Can you bounce back more quickly? How are you meeting a stranger? You know, how are you, if you're in conversation with somebody and you're not that interested and you start thinking about your email, can you come back? Can you kind of gather your attention? How are you in adversity? What what do you add? This is going to last forever. This is only me. Or can you see that and, and let go of that? It's, It's real life stuff and it's the important stuff, you know, so it's good that's where it counts. I just say that a lot because I've seen so many people discouraged through the years because they'll say, you know, I sit 15 minutes a day or something like that and I still get sleepy or I still have thoughts. And I say, that doesn't matter. It's really okay. I also love that anecdote that you have on your website about you, Pandita, who you were having those interviews with him and Barry. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we brought him. He's a Burmese med- meditation teacher. He was a Burmese meditation teacher, a monk. We brought in 1984 to the retreat center where he taught a three-month retreat, which I and many of my friends sat under his guidance. And so he had a sort of teaching style where he would kind of get into a riff and he'd say the same thing every day, again and again and again and again until something shifted inside of you, and then he'd go on to something else. So we were supposed to describe one sitting meditation and one walking meditation from the previous 24 hours when we went in to see him. So he just had some information, like I got really sleepy or I was really restless or I was filled with peace or whatever. Most of us took notes. Like at the end of a sitting, we would just briefly write something down. At the end of a walking, we'd write something down. And we'd go in to see him the next morning with those notes, and as I did. And before I could read anything about my sitting or my walking, he'd say, tell me everything you noticed when you washed your face, which was nothing. So I'd leave, (laughs) and I'd sit, and I'd walk as mindfully as I could. And then when I washed my face, I'd feel my hands in the water, and I'd feel the water on my face. And I'd go in the next day, and before I could say anything, he'd say, Tell me everything you noticed when you drank a cup of tea, which was nothing. So I left, and I'd sit, and I'd walk, and I'd wash my face really mindfully, just in case he went back to that. (laughs) And I drank a cup of tea. I felt the warmth of the teacup, and I smelled the tea, and I 
taste of the tea, and I'd go in the next day and he'd say, tell me anything you noticed when you took off your shoes, which was nothing. <laughs> so I quickly saw where things were going, and I thought, this is going to be horrible. And it actually was wonderful because everything became like a meditation and everything was important and everything was a place to begin again. You know, if I was drinking a cup of tea and got mad lost in some kind of fantasy and I realized it, I had to start again holding the cup right there. Final question for you, Sharon. When you think about success these days, who or what comes to mind? The first person that came to my mind was Ai Jin Poo, who, as a, an advocate for domestic workers, including home health care workers, I think about somebody who cares, as she does, who was trying to help a group of people that were generally unseen, you know, or disparaged and, and treated unfairly, and that just watching the evolution of time, not that anyone is really treated fairly these days, but it's an actual movement. And given the pandemic, given the phrase essential workers, what was known inside families, but not really understood by society, it's a growing understanding. Like I've been to many memorial services for say the parent of a friend of mine, and somebody will always say, it was because of so-and-so, the home health care worker, that my mother was able to die at home. You know, or so-and-so saved us as a family. And so, you know, if you've had the experience, you'd have individual appreciation and respect, but certainly not as a society. And, and so I just think of somebody like her, you know, who, you could say labored in relative obscurity for a long time. And now it's it's a much more pronounced movement. I want to end this conversation by going back to something we talked about in the beginning, which is your love for caterpillars. <laughs> and what You're that sending me a caterpillar? <laughs> no. What that <laughs> represents for me, you know, because a lot of times, again, that's a very common, almost a cliche-ish sort of metaphor for transformation and change, you know, the caterpillar and the butterfly and the cat. And we put all this emphasis on the process and the butterfly, but the caterpillar kind of gets dismissed as this phase, this throwaway thing. You have to go through that in order to get to the big reward of being a butterfly. And the fact that you didn't really care about the butterfly part, you were really focused on the caterpillar part. For me, that represents a celebration of humanity, which is what this is, because it's the humanity that we are getting an opportunity to express ourselves through as spiritual beings. And I think when you evolve to a point in your practice where you stop looking for samadhi, you stop looking for bliss, you stop looking for all of that, you realize, hey, the gold is actually in the caterpillarness of your life. It's in everything. It's in the washing of your face. It's in the taking off your shoes. It's in taking the line out of that email. It's like those little moments where you find that space. And and I feel like that's something that you uniquely contribute to this, this meditation space, just from your own lived experience and all of the trauma and the tragedy and the humility that you bring to the space through your various platforms and books. So I just want to acknowledge you for that. And hopefully, you know, we'll get to enjoy many more books and, you know, God knows what else, documentaries and movies and stuff <laughs> based on based on your your life. I mean, I'm sure it must be weird to see like Ram Dass's documentaries and things, you know, having been with him in the early days. So, hey, I think that's going to be something that all of you guys, you and, and Goldstein and Cornfield and, you know, you're kind of like the Justice League of, of spiritual <laughs> practitioners. <laughs> That's fabulous. For people like me who, who you know, I've only been doing this for 15, 20 years, which sounds like a long time to people who've never done anything, but 50 years in the game, that's 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 pretty significant. So anyway, I thank you and I'm standing on your shoulders and I appreciate all that you've done to bring this awareness to our society. Well, thank you so much. It's such a delight to meet you and, and get to talk to you. 
Thank you for listening to my conversation with Sharon Salzberg. You definitely want to pick up a copy of her book, Real Change. She's also prolific on Twitter, so you can follow her there as well as on Instagram at Sharon Salzberg. She's got classes at the Insight Meditation Society website, on the Insight Timer app, as well as in her various audiobooks. And don't forget to check out the Meta Hour podcast, which publishes a couple of new episodes each month. And if you felt inspired by hearing Sharon's incredible backstory, I do have a small ask. The best way to support this podcast is by taking 10 seconds to rate it. If you haven't already done so, all you do is just look down at your screen of your phone right now. Click where it says at the end of the tunnel, which is in purple. If you're not listening to this on the Apple Podcast app, look for a button that says listen on Apple Podcast. And once you get there, you'll see the purple link. And then you scroll down past all of the previous episodes to where it says ratings and reviews and just tap that star on the far right and you left a rating. It's that easy. And I thank you in advance for taking the 10 seconds to do that. It really means a lot. But more importantly, that is what will lead Apple to potentially feature this podcast on their new and noteworthy section. And that's essentially how podcasts get the most traction. So that's really the best way you can help me spread the word right now. It's just by leaving a rating. And you can get the show notes and a transcript of my interview with Sharon at lightwatkins.com slash tunnel. While you're there, don't forget to sign up for my daily dose of inspiration email, which is a short and sweet daily motivational message that I've been sending out every morning for years now. In fact, my next book is based on my daily dose emails. It's called Knowing Where to Look, 108 Daily Doses of Inspiration. It's coming out in May of 2021, but of course you can pre-order it now. Thanks again for listening to the podcast and for sharing it with your friends and followers. I will see you back here next week. Same time, same place with another amazing story from the end of the tunnel. And in the meantime, keep trusting your intuition, keep following your heart, keep taking those leaps of faith, and I will keep sending you lots of peace and love. Have a great day. 